Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is June 23rd, 2023, and we are here uh, in part two of this epic, important, inspiring, heartwarming, thoughtful uh, interview with Celeste M. Davis. Hey, Celeste. Hi. Welcome back. Thanks. Um, we, Celeste, uh, we just did an amazing part one with Celeste about kind of, um, I don't know, losing, there, there are various titles that we had for the episode, um, you know, de but, but really destructing, deconstructing Mormon God. So in part one, Celeste talked all about being a super Mormon woman, doing all the things, serving a mission, getting married in the temple, and then even writing articles for the Mormon church as a, as a successful blogger, writer, doing the mom thing, but then her husband having faith issues and then herself going through her own faith journey. And we ended part one with, with, uh, Celeste's Mormon God, uh, both dying, but also reconstructing into a new God, which you described as big love, right? That was your, your new God became big love, right? Right. Yeah. Yes. And how that was exhilarating for you on the one hand, but sort of devastating and toxic for you to stay engaged in Mormon church activity, subject your family and specifically your children to Mormon shame and fear and all the nastiness. Um, and the way that we ended part one was with you just saying, I can't keep going to church. And mm -hmm. so you had what was called your done day, which was where right before COVID happened, you realized you couldn't go to the Mormon church anymore and take your kids. Um, and that's how we left it. Mm -hmm. So we decided beforehand that part one was going to be about deconstruction. But we should also say that your big love God was very exhilarating and positive to you. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't all dark and negative. It was also no. exciting. But what we want to focus on for part two is reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you uh, are, your, your title, which is a little bit... Um, it, it, uh, it warrants explanation. <laughs> yeah, Your yeah. current coaching title is? It's spiritual director, which yes, is a bit of a misnomer even among spiritual directors. Cause it's from like decades, decades past when this industry was created, but we often prefer the term spiritual companion because we're not directing anything. <laughs> we're basically a companion for your spiritual journey, wherever that is, whatever that is. That's what we do. Yeah. And I don't want people to like go, oh my gosh, God talk or oh my gosh, spirituality talk. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think, I don't sense a ton, of, not that I want people who are pro woo to be turned off. I don't want to shame anyone. Yeah. But I do get the sense that when you talk about God, it's kind of in quotes. Definitely. And when you talk about spirituality, there's not a ton of woo in it. It's It's more about like, being in contact with the present moment, nature, being connected to yourself much more than like angels or priesthood power or even a, a sky daddy. Right, definitely. I mean, I don't know that I myself would listen to a, a podcast called Reconstructing God and be like, meh, pass. Because <laughs> that those terms and that language and even the word spirituality leaves a little bit of a bad taste in my mouth, which I think it does for a lot of people who leave the church. It's like, hard pass, like been there, done that, ouchy, painful, not interested. And I very much relate to that. I'm not saying like, I understand you. I'm saying I am you. <laughs> like I, it's really hard for me to be in rooms where, you know, needing to discuss the God where I, the God resembles the God of my past. I just have such a bad taste in my mouth for all of that. And I want to be free from that. So, um, yeah, just relating to <laughs> all of the triggers around both spirituality and God. Yeah. So the titles that we came up for this part, uh, kind of lo losing church and finding God, but God in quotes, uh, finding God in quotes after Mormonism, spirituality after Mormonism, but even I'd, I'd think of spirituality in quotes or finding spirituality after religion. And really I'm passionate about this because the Pew Foundation has made it really clear that the largest and fastest growing religious group in the United States are people leaving their religions altogether. It's called the nuns, N-O-N-E, 
The Rise of the Nuns. You can Google it. It's a whole Pew Foundation series of reports about how people are fleeing religion, not just Mormonism, but Christianity in general and other religions, certainly in the Western world and in parts of the East as well and the South. But more importantly, oftentimes they're identifying as spiritual, but not religious. Mm -hmm. So like, but then that beg that begs a question of like, well, how, what does that mean? And I also get so many Christians, and I'm curious to eventually in part two to hear if you even self-identify as Christian, but so many Christians or theists, I'll say, who are like, I'm so sad that when people leave Mormonism, they throw God out or they throw Jesus mm -hmm. out or they throw the Bible out mm -hmm. or they throw Christianity out. And I I don't like that comment because it implies that there's something wrong with being secular, with being, mm -hmm. and I don't even identify as an atheist or an agnostic per se, mm -hmm. but I just don't like this bias of like, your life sucks without God or you're, you're right. inferior without Jesus or you're missing something if you don't have Jesus in your life. And that's fine if, if Jesus or God is useful to people in whatever form, then I want to support that because like yeah. literally at the end of the day, I just want people to be healthy and happy. Mm -hmm. So that's the intro for part two. So yes. we left off with your done day. Your Mormon God came crashing down while your big God lifted up. But I think you also had other deconstructions, your big love God. I think you had also other deconstructions that followed your Mormon God deconstruction. Oh, definitely. Yeah. It's a set of dominoes, isn't it? Like you, de you deconstruct Mormonism and then you're deconstructing patriarchy and you're deconstructing capitalism. You're just everything, all of it, all at once. <laughs> yeah. You're just questioning everything. Like what else am I being duped on? <laughs> and also like, I'm sure like your marriage, like did oh, I, yeah. I've married this guy? Like, did mm -hmm. I want to have four kids? Well, could monogamy I... in general, like, is that just another lie I'm being duped on? Is that it has to be this way? Yeah, totally. Everything's called into question for sure. Okay. Yeah, for sure. So where do we pick off in your pick up on your story? Yeah. So okay, COVID just hit. I just had my. I'm never going back to church. Like we're realizing we're going to have. Si at the time, we thought it was six weeks off of church, and because that's what six weeks off of school was what we were initially told, and so we're like, we're never going back. Yay! And it was just feels like such a relief, and we're excited, but also this is going to be hard. But we're so grateful for this like kind of cushion where we don't have to tell our families, we don't have to tell anyone. We can just kind of figure stuff out. We're happy doing home church. We're still very like. I would say at that time, very Christian, very like, we want God in Christ, but in a new, healthier way. Um, and, and the interesting thing about leaving the church was that like, I really felt like this is the end of my story. Now it's being tied up with the pretty pink ribbon. And now I am like done. I already deconstructed and I was already angry and now I'm happy and bye. Blessings and kisses. <laughs> I am going to go frolic off in the wilderness and live my happy life. Mm. And um, really, like, I wanted my story to be um, so a big part of my deconstruction actually was Richard Rohr's idea that um, you go from order to disorder to reorder. And you don't get to, like, I tried so hard to skip disorder. I want to just go order it to be nice and easy and simple and clean. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be angry. I don't want to be this like down. I don't want to be nihilistic. I don't want, I just wanted it to just be like, I had this God and now I have this God and it was nice there. And now it's nice here. That's all. Mm -hmm. And I wanted my messy stage to be behind me. And I really thought that it would be. I really thought that leaving the church was like the finish line. I'm crossing the finish line. I've already deconstructed. I've already been angry. And now I'm done. And now I'm happy. And now I'm at peace. And now hooray for me. And it wasn't like that at all. Um, it was the starting line. It was the starting line. Like there was so much more to deconstruct. So much more. I didn't even really start going into church history till after I had left, which was a whole other can of worms. I didn't even... my crisis of like patriarchy, awakening to the patriarchy was absolutely just as painful, just as big, just as earth shattering as my crisis of faith in the Mormon church. And it, that was all everywhere, all at once, too, like all over the world, all throughout history and very much prevalent in my life. Devastating. Learning about that, reading about that, thinking, seeing my life in a whole new lens. That's happening after I left the church. Um, just so much like, and then I really just felt like walking out of this mental fog of conditioning that I never knew I was in. I didn't know that I, I just thought my thoughts were my thoughts and I am acting as a logical agent and that's it. I'm weighing the evidence like a logical person. But then I walk out, I'm like, oh, 
well, how convenient that all of my logical thoughts happen to have been what the church taught me to think. And walking out of that and being like, whoa, this goes so much deeper than I ever realized in the church. Because you always want to think that you're acting morally and as your own agent and you're the one in control. And it's scary to look back and realize, like see yourself in that fog and be like, wow, no, there was so many more agents at play in my brain than just me. Yeah, absolutely. So um, where do you go from there? Right? Like, yeah. <laughs> like, was it a dark night of the soul for you? Did mm. you get depressed? Did you feel like your identity crashed to the floor? Did you look at other churches? Did you try and church shop? You had found that church that you talked about. You could okay. just join that one and get baptized to become the head pastor. Like, where'd you go? Yeah. So for me, the dark night of the soul analogy doesn't quite hold in terms of like, it was like dark and black. And then the dawn came and it was shiny and happy. The end. It was always like I would feel dark and then exhilarated and then dark all within the same hour, all within the same minute sometimes, just like up and down, both when I left the church and before I left the church. And it was always like this like exhilarating freedom, back to like this deep grief, back to like just constantly just confusion whirlwind. <laughs> but spiritually, um, yeah, I was definitely riding this high for a couple of years once big love exploded in my life and I'm happily walking on my little Eckhart Tolle cloud with my leaf <laughs> like a baby <laughs> and just like everything is God, everything is spiritual, happy, happy, happy. The world is new. Yes, everything is beautiful and lovely. So that's happening at the same time as I'm having this huge patriarchy crisis, at the same time I'm like massively deconstructing church history and feeling like deep grief and betrayal. All of that's coexisting all at once. But I... um so at the time, part of the story is I had this marriage blog and it is like my job. I am a pro professional blogger making an income and I am writing a marriage article every week and I like can't do it anymore because I like don't care. I'm like, well, I'm also actively deconstructing monogamy and I'm feeling embarrassed that I <laughs> have spent mm. so long being like marriage, 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 do it, do it better, more, do it more. And I'm like, oh gosh, divorce is so super valid and fine. And it's not your fault and you're not bad if you get divorced. And I'm feeling yeah. like lots of conflicts internally about like I'm teaching the Gottman classes on the seven principles to make marriage work. And I'm having these really squirmy moments where we're teaching and it's basically like, here's the seven reasons you get divorced, you dummy. <laughs> like, you're like contentious and you're you know, like stonewalling and you're doing all of these things. And so I'm like, but what about if divorce is the right choice? Like, where is the option there? Like, why aren't we talking about that and how that's completely valid and fine? Mm -hmm. So I start feeling really squirmy in teaching these classes. And even my marriage blog in general starts feeling like, Ugh, I don't think I can keep doing this. And I'm a writer and I'm, ha I'm no longer writing for the church. So I'm having all of these thoughts and just like these epiphanies and these like tornado of just like words that I really want to channel and get out of me and publish. And I don't really have an avenue for that because I'm not talking about that on my marriage blog. So I stop writing marriage articles and I start an Instagram account where I'm just writing essays about spiritual deconstruction and deconstructing for Mormonism. I haven't said publicly that I have left the church, but I have basically, but it was COVID. So it was iffy. Didn't really have to stake a claim in anything. And this is, I think what I first discovered you because I, I noticed your Instagram videos. You would do like little five or 10 minute, let's go to the chalkboard. Yeah. yeah. Let's do some Mormon deconstruction. And yeah, I yeah. thought you, I thought you were a progressive Mormon. Yeah. 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 Right. That's how you presented in my interpretation. Yeah. Well, an interesting part of my story is like, I'm giving you all the behind the scenes of, I am deconstructing for years and I am like falling apart and I'm like in the fetal position of my bed crying after church, but frontward pre presenting I was in the Stake Relief Society presidency and I was like very active and I had gone to the temple every month forever, my entire adult oh, life. Wow. I went from, I in my head, like I was deconstructing and unraveling and falling apart, but on paper and presenting, I really went from zero to a hundred. Like I, it looked like an, a very abrupt switch, um, which was interesting, but I still really feared uh people's judgment. I was still really grappling. Something that was very hard for me was this, like creating a new identity 
um, was really hard because I didn't identify as an ex-Mormon. I had lots of very negative stereotypes about ex-Mormons, and I couldn't see myself in that role. I like thought they me? were very, like me. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> I thought they were very angry and like seeking a fight, seeking contention. <laughs> And I was like, that's not me. I'm like super nice. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't want to be one of them really. And I don't know what to do with that. And so I'm going to kind of be in the, I'm not going to go to church, but I can't quite call myself an expert. I'm in this middle land, this fuzzy, I don't know quite what to do with myself. So it's at this stage that I start an Instagram account where I'm not especially anxious to like throw in my towel with the like ex-Mormon influencers I'm just kind of in my own middle. I'm just talking about God. I'm just doing my thing. And I end up, yeah, attracting a lot of progressive Mormons. And people think I was. Um, and that's Celeste M. Davis mm -hmm. in the Instagram account. Yeah. Celeste with an E at the end. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's all going on. And that's playing a part in my story. And it's really helpful. I'm feeling a lot less alone. I'm attracting a lot of followers pretty quickly. Um, Can I ask a question that I asked you off, off screen? Yeah, sure. So there's this whole like... Patrick Mason, Jennifer Finlayson Fife, uh, Thomas McConkey, uh, Faith Again, Faith Matters, Restore Movement right now happening mm -hmm. that sort of is like part, th let, let's just say Dalek and Sunstone tried it, they died, I tried to do it, I got excommunicated, and then like Dan Witherspoon and Janice Spangler and others tried to do it. And, you know, it didn't work. Gina Colvin almost got excommunicated. Thoughtful faith, all that. But, like, it's almost like a four, version four or five version of progressive Mormonism that mm -hmm. is now emerging. Mm -hmm. And I went to Restore, like, last fall. And it's Terrell and Fiona Givens. It's Patrick mm -hmm. Mason. It's Jennifer Finlayson Fife. It's all these people. Carol, Carolyn Pearson was on mm -hmm. stage, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Why... What kept you from just joining that wave and writing it? I just want to, well, per, this is total geeking out on funny. my part. Why aren't you one of the stars <laughs> of, of the Restore Faith Matters movement? Well, I'll tell you, John, it wasn't for <laughs> lack of trying. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, totally. No, like for a few years there, when I was like writing this progressive woman thing, I'm writing for the church, I'm getting this notoriety. I was like, absolutely in another universe that happened. And I'm still in the church. Probably. I don't know. I love gold stars. <laughs> like, and those were my, you were naming my heroes for 2018, 2017. Are you kidding me? Terrell and Fiona Givens inhaled their books. Jennifer Finlayson Fife. I, uh, we had a short lived podcast on marriage laboratory. I interviewed her several times. Um, loved her like role model, Carolyn Pearson, for sure. All of these people, these are my icons. These are my role models, but I guess it did reach a point. So for a time I would have loved that. Um, but there was a time my conscience did catch up to me and I was speaking at a thing called the salt conference, which is a conference for women, similar to Time Out for women, but not run by the church run privately where they ask, it's a big convention for Mormon women, um, at the Marriott center downtown. And, um, in Salt Lake. And anyway, I was speaking at this event and this is probably four or five months before I leave, but I'm not planning on leaving even at this point at really. Um, I'm just trying to make it work as a progressive Mormon. Um, anyway, and I'm speaking and I'm speaking about faith crisis, which is good. That's not a violation of my conscience, but just sitting through that conference was so hard not to bolt. Like everything said is going against my values. Everything said is going against my conscience. There's a horrendous talk on mixed faith marriage about never giving up that your husband will rejoin the church. That is so awful. And um, just all of it is so squirmy and uncomfortable. And I was just had a moment. I was like, Celeste, like, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing here? You can't keep living this double life. Like I knew that this couldn't be my audience. Like it was too hard and it was too, I was just, I didn't, and that was probably the moment where I was like, I didn't, I don't want this. If this is like, even if this means like I maybe have a book or I'm on time out for women or whatever it would be, I was like, pass. Like I can't keep playing this game. It's taking too way too big of a toll and it is going against my integrity. But that's a step, let's say, church authority wise, a step up from the faith matters crowd. I think yeah. because if you're, you know, time out for women, salt circles, that's still kind of really faithful. Yeah, that's true. Um, so like 
it seems like there still could have been that step down from the church's perspective of playing in that Dan Witherspoon, Janice Spangler, mm-hmm. Patrick Mason, Terrell and Fiona Gibbons world. But but are you just saying, but even them, I'm all my observation is they're still upholding the authority. Yes. They're still upholding the yes. patriarchy. They're still afraid to ever offend anyone. They won't allow any criticisms of church leaders. Um, even though they're trying to be as feminist as they can be, talk about mother in heaven mm-hmm. occasionally, try and be as pro LGBT as they can without getting in trouble. Can you name why even that crowd maybe at some point didn't or doesn't work for you? Oh yeah, absolutely. That's a tightrope walk. I wrote, I walked that tightrope on both my marriage laboratory account. I did talk about the church some on that account. You're kind of a pioneer. Um, and <laughs> well, thanks. Um, and on my Instagram before I like publicly said, I'm done with the church. I was walking that tightrope because if you don't walk the tightrope of being so careful of you can push back, but just a little bit. And you really have to constantly throw yourself under the bus because you're still not really allowed to throw the brethren under the bus. And you're supposed to, and if you ever do throw the brethren under the bus, you have to make a million like apologies or like just word it so carefully, so just right. Otherwise you get a firestorm of people pushing back and like calling you an apostate or, you know, it's just this tightrope walk that's so exhausting. And I was exhausted by it, um, even just on my Instagram account where, you know, walking that apologetic line of like, I want to push back, but I have to do it in the smallest little socially approved way. And yeah, it was exhausting. And it was um, freeing when I was finally like, you know what? I'm done. I'm done. I'm publicly done. I don't have to walk this tightrope anymore. I don't have to be so careful about how I phrase things and how I, I push back, but just a little bit so that I can still be in the circle. Yeah. It was a relief. Okay. So you're not like wishing you were in that scene. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, gosh, no. I'm so glad that alternate universe does not exist for me because, oh, playing that game. You needed to be out. Yes. You needed to be ex-Mormon. I hate to say it. Yes. It was exhausting. It was exhausting to walk that tightrope. Absolutely. No, yeah. And I realized like this, I can't keep doing this. I can't. Mm. And I watched back my, I was just doing it in preparation for this interview, like watching some of my earlier videos, reading some of my earlier essays and they're cringy to me now because I'm watching myself walk the tightrope of being more apologetic towards the church than I actually felt at the time, but Mm. playing that game Mm -hmm. for like, you just kind of have to play it. And I'm just constantly saying like, I'm not trying to get you to leave the church. I'm not trying to get you to leave the church. I don't care. 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 Like, that's not my goal. That's my goal. Stay, listen to me. Keep listening. Stay here. Stay here. You know, like, don't go away. I'm not like, you know, like. You just defied in the past 18 years of Mormon stories. (laughs) It's exhausting. Yeah. Okay. So at that point when you're just like, I'm out. Yeah. There's like, what about your identity? What about Mm. your marriage? What about God? What about spirituality? What about your kids? What about your family? What about all the regrets? Like, that's that's the tsunami dark night of the soul. Did you hit that? Oh, yeah. I mean, different. And again, it's happening simultaneously as like this big, beautiful freedom thing. So it's complicated. It's all in the same hour. I am like a free bird flapping my wings and like flying for the first time. I'm like, hooray, I'm free. While at the same time, like, <laughs> my life is a patriarchal tragedy. It's like tragedy. that tangled scene when she's yes, out, of the, totally. out of the tower. Absolutely. And she's sobbing and doing cartwheels. That is the year. A minute yes. Each. The yeah. year after I left was that scene. A hundred percent. Okay. Like, and I'm first time. I mean, I don't know which thread we want to follow for first here. I guess I'll just speak briefly on like my patriarchy crisis. Um, that I was such a late blooming feminist, such a late blooming feminist, <laughs> but I read the book. Um, let's see what was first. Oh, it was dance of the dissident daughter by Sue Monk kid. Mm-hmm. And it just, I felt like somebody was poking a hot poker onto a wound. I did not know I had, and it was open and it was gaping. And here it was being named the feminist wound the like the feminine, the mother God wound and the earth, not, ha- I mean, the history of the world, not having access to a female deity, I, tragic, so many awful repercussions of that in the world, in history. How would history be different if we were allowed access to a mother God instead of a male, very patriarchal, strict God? And also in my life, how would my life have been different if I had had, I had this, so many struggles. I just spent three hours talking about constantly struggling with this male God that was punitive and strict and rigid and harsh. And how different would my life have been if it would have allowed access to a mother God? And um, that wound, that feminist 
wound of being in a patriarchal church, that book, Dance of the Dissident Daughter, was just like it ripped open this grief that I didn't even know I was walking around with. And then I read the book. Um, oh my gosh. The Feminist Manifesto. Is that what it's called? Um, Betty Friedan in 1963. Oh, The Feminine Mystique? The Feminist Mystique. That's what yeah. it's called. Feminist Mystique. Oh my gosh. I love what I know a feminist thing. Good job. <laughs> that book eviscerated me. Like, I'm like, ha- this book was written in 1963 and she is literally describing my life. Like somehow Betty Friedan got a time machine, lived my life, went back to 1963 and wrote a book about it. Like I, my jaw was on the floor. I was just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like all that she calls like the problem with no name, this like problem of stay-at-home moms. They're just can't quite scratch this itch of fulfillment and why and what is happening and why am I not fulfilled? And I was promised I would be, but here I am not. And I want more, but I shouldn't want more. And my kids are great and I love them, but also I'm in this little box of this house and I'm trapped. And anyway, it was just like, Oh man, my, my feminist wound again, just ripped open, gaping open. I'm like, Oh my gosh, Mormon women are just stuck in the 1950s and we're not allowed to get out because we're told God wants us to be in the 1950s playing house all the time. And like all of her stories of all of her interviews of fifties housewives, I'm like, this could have been written by my next door neighbor. Like this could have been written by my best friend. This could, all of these stories of secretly secret unfulfillment. And, um, you have to kind of keep it under wraps because you don't want to be a feminist. You don't want to complain. You don't want to make waves. You're just walking this little, you know, life that they tell you to lead that you're supposed to be fulfilled with. So reading that book was just like, Oh no, Mm. I'm stuck in the fifties. And like, Mm -hmm. here I am. I left the church. I'm a free bird flying away. I've had this massive new identity, this massive new thing, but like on the outside, I look exactly the same and how that, I didn't like do anything crazy and dye my hair green and like become leather clad and buy a motorcycle. Like I am, I was a 1950s housewife and now I left the church. I'm still a 1950s housewife. I'm like, (laughs) oh man, oh no. It's like this invisible, massive shift, but completely invisible. And I felt like, uh uh-oh, what if my life is a tragedy? What if the storyline of my life is a patriarchal tragedy and I'm trapped and it's very sad. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I feel for that. And I was, I think one of the hardest uh, reckonings, let's just say that can happen is just that moment where you kind of come to like you're describing and you have made decisions um, with kind of a conditioned self, Mm -hmm. but you are living the life still of what your conditioned self chose. Does that make sense? And I just think there's a grappling there that can be so difficult, right? Yeah. And Um, there's a a whole grieving process to be sure. There's, it's a, is a grieving process. Yeah. 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 So that was rough. I was not expecting to deal with any of that. Again, leaving the church is supposed to be my fly bird free away finish line. Happy, happy, happy from inner peace from now on. And I'm like, ah, (laughs) I'm deconstructed. And I'm like, also church history is in here. Like I start like for the first time listening to like Sunstone podcast and like, um, I don't know. I'm just learning all of this stuff that I, again, Mm. always thought I knew all of the church history secrets. I never knew them. There's so many, (laughs) like, where do they end? And I'm, after I'm leaving the church, I'm just like in this pit of like, ugh. I thought I was done with the disorder stage and here I am. I'm totally in disorder. Like I have not yeah. reordered. I am And just... kind of layers upon layers upon layers, right? Yes. It sounds like. Oh yeah. And like capitalism totally is coming in there. America yeah. is coming in there. Yes. Like, I'm deacon. Everything I'm like, is everything a fraud? Is everything what? Yes. Like, I, had, oh, no. I had healthcare too. <laughs> And I had education, the education oh, yeah. oh, system, yeah. like all of the, yes, Everything. all the systems. Yeah. And also I'm just feeling so sensitive, like this like little, like sensitive, squishy, soft thing with these yes. harsh winds, because I felt so vulnerable in the realization, like, oh my gosh, I was just taken advantage of for the past 35 years. And really like by people who didn't have my best interest at heart as a woman and who's, and I, I didn't see it. 
I didn't see it. I was duped, you yeah. know, and I, I would have defended them up and down that I wasn't duped and that I wasn't being taken advantage of. And then it was my choice. And I'm seeing like, no. And I'm like, well, what else is keeping me? Who's to say I'm not? That's not the same thing happening now in my monogamous marriage or my country or all of these things. Like, can I trust myself to yes. see even that I am being taken advantage of? Can I trust? I couldn't trust myself a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. Like, that's a really scary feeling to be like, I can't even trust my own brain to see yeah. when I'm being played a fool is a very vulnerable, scary place to be. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So basically everything unraveled. P politically, did your politics also get- My politics changed previous. Okay. Maybe mm -hmm. went deeper, okay. I would say. But leaving the church, they had already changed. Okay. All right. Yeah. So pretty much everything disassembled and fell to the floor. Yeah, yeah. Your life yeah. was in shambles. <laughs> right? Shambles, but I'm still happy taking my nature walks with my pretty leaves. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still feeling free. I'm still feeling excited. It's all happening at the same time. It's complicated. But also, so I guess are ready to pivot to like my spiritual journey post-church now or any other yeah, things like we need to explore? Yeah, like I think we hit full deconstruction okay, now. Okay, yes, yes. Is that right? I would say so. Like, Well, I kept, so I mentioned earlier, like the order, disorder, reorder, mm -hmm. and my constant need to have graduated from reorder. I'm like, I got my diploma. I did that. Been there, done that. Angry stage, check, done. And then kept being like, I'm still here. I'm still here. It's been yeah. seven years. I'm still in disorder. I'm still deconstructing. How annoying. Like I thought I had graduated and I'm still, and it's like just ongoing. It's just like, I don't know that you ever really graduate. It's not like distinct stages like I thought it would be. It's yeah. like a constant process. Yeah, that, that actually really makes sense to me. How did you, I mean, in reflecting about that time, is there anything that you would offer people in the way of kind of comfort or... Um, in the way of sort of, I don't know if anything helped ground you in a moment, mm. not as like some way to just make it all, I'm not trying to wrap it in a bow or anything, but like, is there anything during that time that e emerged for you, you know, as a coping kind of thing? Kind of a way that I mentally construct it still is there's always this really huge appeal of wrapping our stories in pretty pink bows. Yeah. There's like such a pull to be at the end of our story. Closure, right? Talking back. And like this is very, I very much noticed this as a Sunday school teacher where people would talk and the only time vulnerability was really present was in the past tense. Like people bringing up their stories in past tense verbs. Like I had this struggle and then I overcame it mm -hmm. and now I'm fine, pretty pink bow. That's right. like, And nobody was like, currently I am struggling with my self-worth or I am struggling with this is a present tense struggle. Mm -hmm. So there was, I always noticed in Sunday school this like really pull to be at the end of the story and then only talk about your vulnerable moments in hindsight, yeah. not present tense. And so something that, and I even, ugh, this is actually painful to me to go back on my Instagram and watch my videos because that pull is so evident to me where I'm like, I used to struggle with this last year, two years ago, and here's what I learned and now I'm fine and here's my pretty pink bow. Here you go. Um, but I think just allowing myself, which is only like a recent thing, like allow yourself to be in the middle of your story. That's okay. You don't yeah. have to have learned your lesson. You don't have to have made any huge epiphanies to be able to speak about your struggles. That's okay. If you're present tense struggling, there's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing. That's fine. Like you're in the middle of your story. Let yourself be. You don't have to come to any great conclusions. No pink bows. No pink bows. Like it's okay. And I'm trying to like still, it's still the temptation for me. <laughs> yeah. I still like that Mormon arc of like yeah. struggle, lesson, done, check. Yeah. Um, but just, it's, it's hard, I think, to let yourself be in the middle of your story. There's a big pull to finish the story, have the lesson learned, have the check mark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you find that I, I, I think for me, emotional regulation mm. was something that really emerged mm. during my stage of disorder is just realizing, oh, wow, you know, I'm feeling not only in, am I connecting with myself, but now I'm really allowing myself to feel. Oh, yeah. And it was so different. It mm -hmm. was such a drastic change from kind of being in a just a different state, a more conditioned state, a more where you have bows for everything. You have answers. Mm -hmm. Even if you're you know the answers are problematic or don't always keep you safe, you know, you still try to package it. So um, was that true for you? Did you have like moments of just sort of like, 
Woo, intense feelings. Like this feels new. Cause I think oh, for yeah. most of us, we, we were not really taught, first of all, to connect with our feelings and mm -hmm. number two, to really hold them, what it looks like to kind of hold. Oh, definitely. That's such a great point, Margie. Yeah, for sure. That happened to me. So um, even while I was still in the church, um, I didn't say this in the first part, but a big part of my story too is I went to therapy for the first time. Um, and the point of therapy really, for me, I was struggling privately and I was so dead set on staying in the church that I wanted my therapist to give me a three-step process to like get out of my anger. Like all, I, I don't like feeling angry, but I am so, I sit in that church pew and I am filled with rage <laughs> and yes. I hate it. I'm like, I don't like the feeling of anger. I don't want to be a, please take this from me. I will do it. Like, tell me what to do. Tell me how to not be angry. I want to do it. Uh, I don't like being angry. And she was like, very wise. <laughs> she was like, hmm. Maybe that's not the goal. <laughs> like, maybe the goal is not to get rid of your anger. Maybe anger can be our teacher and we can learn about our anger and maybe we can like mm -hmm. discover what it's teaching us and maybe we can like allow it. I'm like, allow anger. That's the devil's thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, and that thing. And then I'm also, there was, there was a, I mean, just getting into the weeds a little bit about emotional regulation. There was a tool that I still use that I found very, very useful by, I think it was by Cynthia Bourgeau. She has like a three-step process on how to actually feel your feelings because normally we think our feelings, like we think through uh, this is this and that's that and this is the why and the da da but we don't actually get into our bodies. So mm -hmm. like her little three-step process is you take a moment when you're being flooded and you notice where it is in your body, what it is, is it in your chest, is it in your head, is it in your throat, what is it, heavy ball, get an image, like just, and then just sit with it. Don't think, just sit with your body mm -hmm. and then give it a name. So is this anxiety or worry or, you know, boredom or grief or whatever it is. And then you say to yourself, welcome fear, welcome grief, mm. welcome anger. And you allow it in your body. And I realized in doing that, I'm like sitting at church and I'm like, welcome anger. <laughs> and I like realized like I had never actually done that. Like I haven't actually let anger in. It was like yes. anger was knocking at my door and I'm doing everything in my power to keep that door shut and ignore it and dismiss it and numb it and not open the door to it. And here I am like, come on in, yeah. come on in. We're going to feel the anger in my body. And then the third step is to like stop the narrator in your head from writing a story. Just like stay present with the feeling. Don't write a story Ooh, about I it. I like that. Yeah. That's like, like you, you can go off and That's thought right. land and then think your feelings instead of feeling your feelings. Anyway. Yeah. So in doing that, yeah, I'm like, I never actually allowed the feeling of anger in ever. And that's, this is new. Yeah. And so, yeah, all of these experiences are new and like a lot learning a lot of things, just allowing it and feeling everything. And yeah. Yeah. That was definitely a part of my journey. Yeah. Well, so there were two main, a theme and a sub theme, theme that you identified. One was like figuring out what God is to mm -hmm. you. And then the second was learning to trust your inner voice. Mm -hmm. So once you've had everything fall to the floor in pieces, um, there's the distrust that comes from realizing all these different institutions had lied to you and failed you. But there's kind of a secondary parallel process for many, which is I trusted all that. I, you know, can I ever trust my own judgment again? Mm, yeah. Because I was an adult Scary. with yeah. all these things totally. in, in many ways. And so, so that comes back to kind of how part one started, which was that little voice of that little girl who was like, wow, all these different churches, how can they all be false except mine? You know? And you pack that down, right? Mm. So talk us through the journey of you figuring out what God did mean to you then. Mm. And if there's a process for learning to listen to and then trust your own voice. Yeah, great question. Um, a huge catalyst in this process of moving my conscience, outsourcing it to moving internal was my big love moment, the massive like, brain explosion was, oh, God is inside of me. God is not this thing I am ascending to, I am climbing to, I'm trying to align with that. I'm always like 
what do you want? I'll just do it. Let me align with you. This carrot dangling, like the right choice, God's yeah. right choice. And I just got to catch it. I just got to figure it out. Now, suddenly it's inside. So that means there is a part of myself that is God that I can trust. And, um, and Jesus even said that, right? Yes. What did he say? <laughs> the kingdom of heaven is within and that, okay. I just have to like bring up this metaphor from Richard Rohr because it was so big for me, um, to have this laid out and be like, you are not crazy was so empowering to me in his book, things hidden where he's talking about the Bible. He lays it out as a person's lifespan. Um, and the old Testament is like when we're kids and, um, he says he finally answered that I could never figure out why the Old Testament God was the way he was. I was constant. Even when I was a strong member, I was like, what is this guy's deal? He seems like a bully, mean and picky and like choose his favorites. And it, Richard Forrest says that's like a projection of like a childlike idea of God. It's like an immature kind of version of like a punitive black and white thinking rules. But also like the Old Testament, you need like leaders, your conscience hasn't formed. And then when it goes into the New Testament, that's like midlife and you're transitioning into um, your second half of life. And then everything flips upside down and the external becomes internal. And now the kingdom of heaven was without. Now the kingdom of heaven was within and the temple was without. And now your body is the temple. And um, this was so validating for me because I was like, I knew it. Yes. Like it is supposed to be like this. You, we are supposed to search our feelings. And, um, from that point on, when I was like, I am on the right track spiritually, cause I just needed somebody to say that in my language was, which was the language of scriptures. That was really big for me at that time. Um, to be able to just kind of validate myself. Like I am on the right track. This is like, I loved that reading of the Bible. I loved that reading of the New Testament. And then like the Pharisees is the example of what happens when you don't shift your conscience internally and your conscience is external. Then you become not about truth. You become about control and you become about, mm. you know, rigidity. And um, so in, you know, it was like a really slow process of learning to trust myself. But like one was like scripture. I had always like checked my thoughts and brain at the door and like my thoughts are over here, but now I have to just align with whatever is said and I'm not questioning it and I'm not thinking about it. And now my whole self and brain and feelings are now invited to the party. And what do I actually feel about this? And what do I actually think about this? And like, I had never been asking myself those questions when I was reading the scriptures before. And also in my whole life, like my motivating question was never, what do I want? It was always, what does God want? And I just, all I wanted yeah. to do was follow what God wanted. And I was, remember I was reading um, Eat, Pray, Love for the first time, which um, I can remember like back in whenever it came out, our Mormon book club read it and everyone hated it. I didn't even read it, but I read it again in like 2018. And she has this paragraph that was so meaningful to me because she had just gotten divorced and she was having her whole life was topsy-turvy like mine was, even though I wasn't getting divorced. But um, she was like, and suddenly there was these whole pockets of my day where it wasn't ever like, what does my husband want? What does my boss want? It was like, what does Liz want? what do I want? And she was like, I had never really asked myself before mm -hmm. as a mid thirties woman, what is it that I actually want? What do I want with this hour? What do I want with this day? What do I want with my house, my life? Like it was, I had never really asked myself. And I was like, oh my gosh, same. I am now like, what do I want? What do I want? And it's not just what God wants for me. It's like, I have God inside of me. Yeah. So now I can ask myself and that have that matter. So a big part of reclaiming my conscience is asking myself, what do I actually want? And then voicing that, which as a woman, you have to go through all sorts of barriers to even get to that question in the first place, because mm -hmm. we're very much taught to please everybody else and not ask ourselves what I want, but ask what my kids want. What do my husband want? What does my boss want? What does my neighbor want? Uh, what does God want? And so actually asking yourself, what is it I want is a really life-changing question. Mm -hmm. And it's a radical act coming out of a Mormon paradigm. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. And a big part, too, of trusting myself was deconstructing the natural man. Um, yeah. The natural man is an enemy to God right. teaching, right? Right. And like really walking through life, actually believing that a part of yourself is Satan is horrifying. And it makes you so afraid mm -hmm. to trust yourself because is this the God part of me or is this just me or is this my natural man? You never know. Or like, Satan or right. sa one of Satan's minions. Right. right? Like. I, again, the like example is like walking around BYU. I have two hours free. Do I take a nap? Is that is that Satan? Is that me? Is that God? 
I don't know. Like it is hard. And it, but just in case it's Satan, maybe we just gonna go really safe. <laughs> like just be productive. Just doubt. read the scriptures. Like play it very safe. Because how horrifying that I could, if I follow my desires, it could be Satan. Mm. Terrifying. Mm. Yeah. So in reconstructing wow. that, um, kind of shifting more from the natural man to like the ego and more like Buddhism's teachings about. The ego is like, well, what do you do with the, yeah, there is a part of yourself that's, you know, maybe cruel or maybe greedy or maybe whatever, not good and selfless or whatever. There's a part of yourself. Sure. But what do you do with that part is very different in Buddhist teachings versus Mormon teachings. Like Buddhist teachings, what you do with that is first you just like notice it and you're like, hello, (laughs) hi, ego, here you are. And then you listen to it. And then you're like, do I want to listen to that? Do I want to do that? You give it a voice and you kind of wrap it in a warm blanket, give it a hug and incorporate it in, like give it a voice, give it a seat, not always follow it. But in Mormonism with the natural man, what you do is you cut it off. You shun it. You cast it off into an island, which is like hacking yourself. Or suppress it or pack it down. Yeah. And so that's scary and hard. And it's a really big shift from like, all of me is welcome here and my selfishness and my laziness and my greed and all of them get a seat at the table and we're just going to listen and do our best to like walk through this life as a moral agent. Um, but with leading with love, not fear. Yeah. 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 All Mm. right. So how did you do that? (laughs) (laughs) I read a lot of books. (laughs) Um, yeah. And just like, again, with my, my intuition, just listening, noticing, naming, um, asking myself what I wanted. There was a, an analogy that really helped me that was like our thoughts are just kind of like fire hydrants and they're just spewing all the time. They're just thoughts, 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 thoughts. And it's like, mm-hmm. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. What am I eating for lunch? Where am I going? There's a million thoughts all the time. And sometimes you shouldn't always listen to all of them because sometimes you have crazy thoughts and sometimes they just come out of nowhere and whatever, harmful thoughts or whatever. Um, but then... You go into the heart space and that space is like a well. And so learning to make decisions, not from my spewy, 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 all the listening to every single thought and identifying with every single thought, but like going into my internal well, which means the pathway to my internal well is solitude, silence, meditation, stillness. And like from that point being like, what do I think? What do I want? And what do I think about this? And also a big part of that is like allowing imperfection, a treating life like an experiment, not like something that it, there is a correct choice. There's a correct path. I must align with it. I must mm-hmm. find it. I must walk it. I must discover it. But just like, maybe this is a mistake. And if it is, I can course correct. I can make apologies. That's okay. It's okay. It's okay to be imperfect. It's okay to make mistakes and just like treating it as an experiment. And then like constantly self-reflecting, how, do I, how did that make me feel? How did that make me feel? Like that. I guess. So instead of a sin, repentance, punishment, forgiveness model, atonement model, it's sort of a learning, Mm -hmm. uh, self-compassion model where you're just learning and experimenting and growing. Yes. Instead of sinning and feeling guilt and shame and trying to fix it. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. It's a totally different mindset. It really is. And yeah, like you nailed it. Self-compassion is at the helm. That's always the compass. Like again, away from shame towards self-compassion, always my new compass. And I could see that. And that was really a big shift. Yeah. Marsha Linehan, just geeking out for a second, Marsha Linehan developed dialectical behavioral therapy. And she's got this idea of rational mind and emotion mind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're too rational, then you're like a robot. You know, you're too analytical, you're too clinical, um, sterile like Spock, you know. Mm -hmm. But if you're all emotion, well, then you're, you know, like irrational and you're potentially violent and you're or you're manic, right? You you don't want to be either. What you want is wise mind. Mm -hmm. Wise mind is the thoughtful integration of reason or intellect Mm -hmm. or rationality and and emotion. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another way to look at, you know, your conscious self or your enlightened self or your inner self or your heart space. 
Mm-hmm. You're saying it's like a well or. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's lots of different ways to kind of describe learning. And, and of course, mindfulness and stillness and even meditation become ways you can practice getting to know and getting connected with this this part of you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Did mindfulness and meditation become part of your practice? Oh, definitely. Definitely. How, how did uh, some people that doesn't work? They mm. try and meditate. It's like, let me reach Zen. Let me sit down. Oh, my mind goes crazy. <laughs> I can't meditate. Mm. What did it, what did mindfulness mean for you in practice? Well, when I, when I started, I started with like a, the calm app, just like 10 minutes a day, um, practice early, like 2015, maybe. And actually, um, it was so revolutionary to me because my contrast to that was prayer. And I was like, um, you know, my prayer was, were, you know, a pattern, like a practice, a habit, but they weren't always like a spiritually connecting thing. When I started meditating, I was like, whoa, I'm having all these spiritual insights. I'm like actively feeling the spirit. I'm like, why are we teaching this instead of prayer? Like, this is way better. I'm feeling so much more connected to God and all of these things. So meditation was part of this whole journey from the get-go for me. Um, I'm kind of good at like well, I'm good at being told what to do and then doing it. And the call map says to not ruin my daily streak. I'm going to do that. <laughs> so it was <laughs> very obedient. Margie, didn't you go like two, two years, like never nice. missing a day of my I relate to you, Celeste. Yeah, we're soul sisters for sure. <laughs> That's me. Yeah. So That's can, awesome. Yes. Um. Anyway, but yeah, so, and I was... I was, I was really into meditation and I did find it to be a really accessible pathway to my inner well, to my inner God, to spirit it was, it was a big practice and, and pathway for me. So I guess now in my spiritual journey, um, I am still out of the church. I am going through these patriarchy crisis and this church history mm-hmm. crisis, but I am thriving spiritually still on that w- riding that high from the big love, from the internal God, from trusting myself, from loving all the parts of myself, just feeling so much more whole than I ever did now that I know that I don't have to hack off big parts of me, like my libido and or my natural man and or all of these things. Now they get to be incorporated in part of the party. Um, And so at the time, I don't know, I'd been out of the church maybe seven months and I heard somebody say something about their spiritual director and I was like, what is that? I never heard of that. And I like, look it up. I was like, Oh, I want one of those, a spiritual companion. Yes, please. I, anybody who was ever who I could pay to talk about my spiritual, I would pay them. Like I paid Dan Witherspoon. I paid Janice, but anybody was like, I'll talk. I was like, yes, I'll hire you. Great. So immediately wanted a spiritual director. Sounded great. I had lots to say. And then I like really soon after I was like, actually, I think I want to be one. So I was just like Googling it for like literally 15 minutes, came up, the Chaplaincy Institute came up in my Google search. They're from Berkeley. They're like this kind of progressive, you know, they're at Berkeley. They're like interfaith. It just felt like a really good fit for me at the time. And I was like full body. Yes. Like within five minutes, I was like, I'm going to apply and I'm going to do this for the next two years. No question. Like I was just immediately, this is an alignment for me. So I'm dying to know, like, Let's just say you had this goal of like figuring out who God was or figuring out what your new spirituality was going to be or whatever it is. I would think that the path would be figured out and then become a coach or a guide or whatever. Is that how you thought about it? Do you feel like you figured it out (laughs) and then you decided to apply to be a coach or a guide or whatever? Or was there some other pathway mindset for you? The funny thing about me, John... I always think I have it figured out. <laughs> so I did. Endless pink bows. <laughs> yes. I always have lots of lessons to, to relate to my fellow humans. <laughs> Not a problem. Um, yeah. And I just joined the program being like, this will be perfect for me. I am like all of these spiritual ideas. I'm like super spiritual. And then it was in heights. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm such an imposter. I don't, do I even believe in God? I don't even think I believe in God. Oh, what's happening? I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> that happened later. <laughs> but at the time of sign up, I was like, all systems go. I mean, this is going to be great. People are going to love this. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, I did not a moment's hesitation signing up for the program. Okay. Applying for the program, applied, got in, started that summer. 
And the first section was great because we studied Taoism and Eastern religions, Buddhism, um, shamanism, so many other things, paganism, Wiccanism. We were studying all these interesting things and I'm just like a sponge and I'm just like loving it in my happy spiritual little bubble. All of it's great. Then we get to studying um, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And I'm like, mm-hmm. blech, blech. like, I thought. What was that? Well, I thought before this program, like religious trauma was like too strong a term for me. I'm like, eh, get over yourself. It's fine. There's worse things. There's worse cults. There's worse whatever. And eh, fine. I sit in this program and it was like, ha ha ha, funny you. Here is your religious trauma. Now I'm presenting to you on this shiny platter. Like mm-hmm. every session was just so, it was painful. Like to sit through these, it was on Zoom and I was reading, doing my readings and. Anytime a man was preaching, all of my hairs on my arm would stand up. I would be like, you can't tell me what to do. You can't tell me what to believe. Mm-hmm. Who are you? Um, you're not better than me. You're not better than me. Sit down. You know, like I would just mm-hmm. be like, mm. and even if they weren't even telling me what to do, it was just, well, and in my program, I started having massive issues with the man in charge of it, even just in a spiritually adjacent realm, giving me assignments, which I had paid him to do. I was like, you can't tell me what to do. Yeah, <laughs> Man, I'm paying you to tell me what to do. I was just like, Mm-mm, I don't have to do that. I don't have to do that. Because as part of the program, you were supposed to be doing like daily spiritual practices. And to me, I was like, no, no, no. I just unboxed God, yes, like a big box sense. of butterflies. You want me to put God back in the box from 6.30 to 7 a.m.? Hell no. I unboxed that. God is my bubble bath. I'm not going back to like yeah. prayer and, you it's know, I was too close. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was like massively triggered and suddenly everything was triggering to me. And I was like, ah, blah, blah. everything's painful. And like I organized religion in general. I was like, I don't want any part of this. I hate this. This isn't interesting to me anymore. I'm not curious about this anymore. I don't like this anymore. So that was tricky because I had paid for this program already (laughs) and I'm in the middle of it and I'm like really triggered. Um, So I'm talking to some of the teachers there, talking to some of the, my people, my cohort, there were 16 of us. They were so great too. But um, anyway, and they're like, it's okay. You don't have to. And also from the beginning, they were very adamant that like, they never said God, they would say the divine and they would always allow space. Like you can call God whatever you want anything like universe, higher self, whatever. There's no restrictions on what you have to believe, just that you have to like, we're learning about all the religions so that in case we were ever to spiritually direct someone from any religion, we could have our due respect for them, learn some of the vocabulary and the history and like everything was fine, whatever anybody believed. We were never, ever, ever there to push our beliefs on them. So our beliefs were kind of irrelevant. We're just learning to have respect and learning how to sit with people, learning holy listening, learning about how to take the people through deconstructing and reconstructing God. Also, I'm sitting through classes, many classes on religious trauma and just weeping uncontrollably, having to turn my camera off because I'm realizing I have so much, so much religious trauma that I'm supposed to help people with, but I have it heavy, deep, and I'm feeling like an imposter. And it was interesting times Mm -hmm. in this program. No, I want to ask about that because- You know, we recently we had an interaction with someone who's experienced, um, you know, assault, and mm. and I was using the word trauma in kind of a bit of a popular way, which is using it more loosely. Um, and they reminded me that PTSD is a serious diagnosis, mm. and that it that it can be hurtful to people who have PTSD diagnoses to hear the word trauma kind of used in a trivial or jokey way. Mm. And it it makes me just sort of ask you to spend a minute on this. Mm. There is a diagnosis, CPTSD, complex post-traumatic stress disorder. I don't know if it's formal, but it's kind of an informal thing that would basically say you don't have to have a natural disaster or witness a death or be physically or sexually assaulted to experience trauma a really bad marriage or a really bad interaction with the boss or a religious tradition can also, you know, end up having symptoms that meet criteria for trauma. Mm. It's just different. Mm -hmm. So when you say religious trauma, Mm -hmm. can you talk more about that? Do you mean trauma, big T? Do you mean little T trauma? Maybe I'm putting you on the spot. 
Oh, that's okay. I mean, I will say we were very much um, schooled in the, at the Chaplaincy Institute to like kind of stay in our lane. And if it's going into like heavy trauma, capital T, very much refer that out to a professional therapist, like a professional mental health professional. That's not our, our lane is more like deconstruction, reconstruction, spiritual stuff. But we did need to be versed in religious trauma because so many people have it, whether they realize it or not. And yeah, we, I mean, we talked about it. Um, if we talked about it in the serious, like capital T big traumas, it was always like, refer that out. Like you're not supposed to deal in your spiritual direction practice with those things. Like there are prof- health, mental health professionals to deal with that, but little like, but just, you know, religious trauma in the terms that like religions do serious harm to your self schema, to your self esteem, to your self worth, to your relationships, to your self trust, um, all of those things definitely still in our lane and needing to be talked about and needing to be voiced and recognized and helping people through that. And how do we do that? Reading books about it. Um, so yeah, we talked about that kind of stuff a lot. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but also when you talk about like just a man standing up talking about these sorts of things Mm -hmm. causes physical reactions Mm -hmm. in your body. Yeah. That is, that's starting to kind of encroach on meeting the criteria, whether it's dreams or flashbacks Mm -hmm. or physical panic attack kind of reactions. Oh yeah. That's starting to sound more clinical to me. Not that you're crossing into that lane. Sure. I just want to try and establish whether there's in your mind, some legitimacy for the T word in a, in a religious transition context. Yeah. And I don't know that I even would have acknowledged it or noticed it if I wasn't putting myself back in that situation. I mean, I can remember, um, we had a three hour zoom class from a man who had written a book. I think it was called Islam for dummies. It was something along those lines, like basically Islam's basic tenets. And he was describing Islam in a way that sounded just very, very familiar to me in the terms like God is not mean because he gives us commandments. He gives us commandments to be happy and he's just wanting us to be happy. And so we re- follow the commandments. They're actually like loving God. It was just sounding so familiar. And so it was so triggering to me. And I was just like, <gasps> like I was like shaking and I had to like turn the zoom call off. I had to walk away because I was experiencing, like my heart was racing. I was sweating. Like I was like, ah, I am disagreeing with this is like sounding too. It was triggering. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know that I would have even known that would have happened if I hadn't experienced it myself. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So through the, this training was two years. How long mm-hmm. was this training? Oh, it was a year of coursework and then a year of practicum where we're meeting with people for free, like to get our hours. That's intense. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of training. Mm-hmm. Um, and would you say that by the time you were done, you like knew who God was for you, <laughs> knew what spirit had mastered spirituality, <laughs> and you were like ready to. The bows you had were the, tied. You had they the were pink, all tied up for you. You had the pink bow. And you were ready to share your pink bow with the world. Oh yeah, just the biggest pink bow. I <laughs> I knew it. I know it all. I'm like, <laughs> no, not at all. I had gotten to the point where I was more, I won't say, I won't wrap a pink bow on this either, but I was more okay with uncertainty than I was Mm. when I had entered the program. So for you, the more comfortable you are with uncertainty, this is like the opposite of Mormonism. With Mormonism, the more righteous and faithful you are, the more certain you are. Mm -hmm. Now you're saying in your new path, the more comfortable you are with not knowing and uncertainty and no pink bows, the more you're kind of seeing that as being a, a more enlightened path. Uh, yeah, I mean, a little, I mean, just, it was important for me for sure to be, and actually I think even the program directors at the chaplain Institute would say the biggest problem they have is not this uncertainty. It is more with certainty. It is more pastors joining the program. They're like, I know everything and I know the way. And so when I would go to all of my teachers and be like, I think I'm maybe an atheist. <laughs> I don't know. Like, ah. And they were like, that's okay. That's fine. Like, you don't have to ascribe to any, like, you're t- completely valid. You're in the right place. Like, and I really worked with one and we kind of worked through w- what I would say, like, cause even when I started the program, I was totally fine with the word divine. But by the end, even the word divine was triggering to me. Spirituality too? Yes. Well, I had a, such a bad taste in my mouth for the spiritual world, frankly. And I got introduced to a little bit more of it through this program, looking very familiar, very much recognizing how much people's egos can play into this game. Like I had just 
Uh, mm-hmm. It was so off-putting to me. Anybody who self-ascribed themselves as a spiritual leader, I was like, Bleh. no, thanks. <laughs> you know, I was like, mm-hmm. who are I? you're not better than me. And um, I had that feeling a lot. You're not better than me. <laughs> but um, like just I was very skeptical of the whole world, the whole realm of spirituality, especially anything institutionalized for sure. Um, but in working with and also we would have a ton of the best part about the program was the breakout sessions with my fellow cohorts, because so many of them had actually deconstructed from evangelicalism. To, like I'd say a full half. Um, so very re- relating on a lot of things. And whenever I, because we would also deconstruct our God thoughts together in breakout sessions and talk a ton about our past. And they were helping me accept where I was because I was always like, oh, sorry, I'm talking about Mormonism again. Sorry, sorry. Is that annoying? I talk about it too much, right? I'm talking about, sorry, I'm still kind of in the middle. I don't know. And like really kind of embarrassed by like how new I was in my journey. And they were like, of course you are you're what, two years out of Mormonism? Like, of course you're still talking about, that was a huge shift, Celeste. Like these like 60 year old women who are like so nice. And they're just like, yeah, we were talking about leaving evangelical church for like a decade, like solid, like deconstructing, like you're two years out. Yeah, of course you're still talking about it. And so helping me to like accept where I was. And also they're kind of helping me recognize like this can also be a gift, like being in the dead middle of your story, not offering pink bows can be a gift. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of going with that and kind of being like, I I am what I am and I have to offer what I have to offer. And maybe I'm not for everybody. And I still had to fight the imposter syndrome of like, I don't feel like I'm relating to this industry of spiritual direction necessarily. I'm feeling like I'm very skeptical of both the word spiritual and all directions. (laughs) So, Mm -hmm. um, but I did have some mentors in the program that helped me kind of, um, and the one that I was working with, we, anytime the word divine was said in my head, I translated awe and wonder became my code words of how yeah. I related to the divine, I guess. Um, yeah. But I even still don't like the word the divine. Yeah. But so by the time, and then when I started my practicum, I started meeting with um, people who followed me on Instagram for free to get my hours. And so they were all either still going to church, but having a faith crisis or just out of the church. And then I could kind of see my value a little more clearly and a little more like, it's okay that I don't believe in capital G God. It's okay that mm-hmm. I'm skeptical of spirituality. It's okay. Yeah. Um, because I can still be, uh, a, well, A, frankly, in mid-session, it's really irrelevant what I believe. <laughs> it's just all about them and listening to them and um, offering them a safe container to explore whatever they're thinking. Yeah. Um, but B, yeah, it can be a gift. To be uncertain and to not know, I can very clearly see how that's a gift in my profession to not have answers, you know. Well, that's that's a big one. Like when you really start boiling down for people what they valued most in Mormonism, it's unconscious, but they valued the certainty. Mm. They valued, I mean, think about it. Mm. What, what is the plan of salvation? I know where I came from. I know who I am. I know where I'm going. I know God's plan. I know how to live. I know what the path is. And I just have to do these 15 or 20 or 10,000 things. <laughs> serve my mission before married temple marriage, have kids, serve my senior mission or missions and then die. And then I'm good. Right. That there are plenty of people that like, that's why they're Mormon. Yeah. But, but to then once they have this faith crisis, they're like, Oh my gosh, now I don't know who I am. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to live. And now I don't know where I go when I die. Mm -hmm. And I don't have anything to give my kids. And like, why should I even live if I don't know that there's an afterlife and a heaven? And like, I don't even know if I want to live anymore. And then you say to them, oh, no, 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 that's the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. The beauty of it is you don't know. And, you know, you watch like secular Buddhism, Noah Rochetta, you know, um, this idea of like you're always falling. Mm -hmm. And certainty was always an illusion. Mm -hmm. Like that makes sense to me now, Mm -hmm. or maybe Margie or you now, but like to tell someone freshly coming out of religion that that's the cool thing (laughs) is now you can really make the most of your life now because that's the only life you are sure you're going to have. To them, that doesn't sound amazing. No. To them, that sounds terrifying and unappealing. Well, we've just come off fresh off a full lifetime of certainty was our security blanket. It was our, it was our comfort zone. It was what we were told was the right thing. It was how we were measuring 
if we're doing the right thing, where is our testimony? Where is our faith? How is it shaken? That's bad. And there was so much comfort. I mean, legitimately, there's so much comfort in being told there is a right path and you don't have to wobble in figuring all this out yourself. Oh my gosh. Whew. Like what a relief. Like talk about parenting. It's a huge, like, oh my gosh, how do I parent my kids now? That is so comforting as a parent to like, okay, I'm not going to screw up my kids if I just follow this path. Okay. It's not up to me. I just follow this path. What a relief. What a relief to be told what to do, to be told how to parent. Like, of course we want that. Who doesn't? That's a relief. If you, especially if you can be certain in that path, that's great, right? It feels so good. And so when that's taken away, that's terrifying. Of course it is. But then, yeah, just like you said, it can be this horrible, terrifying thing. And then in the next breath, it can transform into like the greatest freedom. Like the sentence, I don't have a purpose can be said, oh my gosh, I don't have a purpose. Or it can be like, huh? I don't have a purpose. Hooray. <laughs> like what a great thing. So yeah, but you're right. Like losing certainty is a whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I don't know if this is like too much to the point, but like What's God for you now? Oh, thank you for asking. Um, no, that's not at all. Um, so for me, I don't, I'm not so concerned with like what is truth, what is real. I'm very concerned with like what is functional for Celeste Davis in 2023. Like what is working for me at the moment? Mm -hmm. And um, Deepak Chopra, who after my Calm app meditation, I moved to the Chopra app meditation and I learned lots of spiritual things from him circa 2019 to 2021. And one of his things that I always have kept with me, um, as he says, as humans, we have four needs. We need to feel safe. We need to feel loved. We need to feel worthy. And we need to feel whole. And if we lack those things, we will go seek them in other people to fill them in us. Typically through status or success or popularity, we will like, if we feel deficient in feeling worthy, for instance, we will seek our worth in something outside of us. And so our job is to just figure out um, what is it? What is a daily practice or what is an idea or an image that makes me feel safe, whole, worthy, and loved? And it's just an annoying human fact that we kind of need to fill that need daily or else we become kind of a dirge on our fellow humans needing them to fill that for us. And um, it just is the work. It just how annoying that we have that need, but we do. And so when God is at its best... Ideally, God would make us feel whole, safe, loved, and worthy. Unfortunately, for many organized religions, God is not the provider of that. God is the barrier to that. Hmm. God is who we have to prove our worth to. God is whom we have to earn our love from. God is, frankly, like we are innately broken and there's a path to feel whole, but we're not innately whole. We're only whole through the atonement. So, or through the church's intermediary involvement in right. our relationship with God, right? Right, like the sacrament, yeah. Yeah. Uh, or, or the bishop. Yeah. Or the temple recommend, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, moment of silence for what an unfortunate situation that is. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> what should be our source is the barrier. And so for me, God is whatever in the moment helps me to feel whole, safe, worthy and loved. And that's what I provide people in my spiritual direction sessions is we're just on a road of discovery for whatever image, whatever thought, whatever practice is bringing those four things up for you that you can then return to in moments of self-doubt or moments of uncertainty or moments of fear. What is a grounding idea or practice or mentality to return to that place of centeredness, that place where you can feel grounded and whole? And so that's always changing for me. Um, and again, I'm still like, I still haven't completely left my high from the big love explosion where I still delight in like, yeah, like I take a bubble bath and I'm like, this is God to me in this moment right now. Hallelujah. There's no barrier to it. I don't have to earn it. It's making me feel whole and safe and loved and worthy. Yay. And I love that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why well, you're making eyes at me, Margie. What are you? I was just wondering if you can relate oh. as a lover of baths. Oh, I love <laughs> Yeah. I take one to two to three baths he a day. He loves baths. I love baths too. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure what you're, Margie's making eyes at me. I'm like, what did I do? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I love so, that. So like God in a bubble bath. <laughs> 
Um, you know, so let me let me dig a little bit deeper on that. So, sure. So, like, on the one hand, I love this. I, okay, first of all, Carolyn Pearson just said it so eloquently decades ago, where love is, their God is also. Mm-hmm. Like, just the idea that God is love. Mm-hmm. And I, boy, I love that. That mm. really simplifies it. Yeah. Anywhere there's love, let's just call that God. And anything, you know, everything is holy now. It's a song by Peter Mayer. We'll have Julia included in the show notes. It's an amazing song. And the idea is is that God is everywhere. Everything is holy. And that's it. It's just like whatever moment you're in, that's God. Yeah. The person who's manning the cash register when you're at the grocery store is the most important important person in your life in that moment. Mm -hmm. And that's your divine opportunity to be divine to them, for them to be divine to you. You can learn from them. They can learn from you. That may take a little bit more time than the people in line are hoping that you'll take. I'm joking. But, like, yes, divinity everywhere. So, like, I love that. And I guess two questions emerge from that. Mm -hmm. If God is everything, then in a sense God is nothing. Because if we're just saying God's everywhere and God's everything and God's all things, like... It starts, there's a lot of people that are like, no, 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 it's Sky Daddy. It's beard, it's male, it's up there, it's a, it's got a body, feet, 10 fingers, 10 toes, you pray to it, it knows you personally, it answers your questions. Like, you, you go from like, in Mormonism, something so concrete and specific, and like takes up time and space, to like, everything? Like, what's the value? Hmm. That's one. Mm-hmm. And then there's a second part to that question, and I hope I can, I, I'm sorry I'm asking such a huge, two huge questions. The second thing is, if you're like looking at it from a more of a secular point of view, why even bother with God talk? Hmm. Why not just say like, this is life? Hmm? And why even have to discuss it in terms of spirituality or divinity or, or God? Because that's just like, why? Why yeah. even, why do you, it almost privileges this idea that like everything's got to be framed religiously. Like mm-hmm. sometimes people are like, well, why don't you identify as atheist or agnostic? And I'm like, because I don't even like the framing. Mm-hmm. Like, why did why does it why do I have to have an identity framed out of whether there's a God or not and what religion I'm in? Like, mm-hmm. what if I think those are all bad questions, not even useful questions or identities to be considerate? Mm then why do I have to adopt any sort of religious or non-religious identity? I don't even want any of that to be part of my identity. Sure. Those are like, there's probably like 10 books in each of those two <laughs> questions. <laughs> but, but I'll start with the first. So okay. if God is everything, God is nothing, how is that even useful or meaningful? I don't have any problem with God being nothing or God being. And also, I mean, just to hit on your second one, I don't hear anything wrong with not being anything, not having a label, not no need to believe in religious religiosity or God at all. Really? Like for but me. But yet you're calling yourself a spiritual advisor. <laughs> Companion. Companion. Is that it? <laughs> yes. Spiritual companion. But a lot of my work, to be fair, as a spiritual companion, is giving people permission that there is no need to be spiritual. (laughs) They don't have to do this thing because I think a lot of times when you leave a high demand religion like Mormonism, there's this big pressure like, oh my gosh, I had all the things and now I am in a void and now there is nothing and now I must fill this void with an equal amount of certitude about what's going to happen. And I I just came from this paradigm where I was given all the answers. So now I have to find all new answers and all new certainty and all new, you know, method of spiritual practices and spirituality. And a lot of part of my job is just companioning people, listening to people mostly, but also offering the idea, what if you don't need to do any of that? What if you can just be uncertain and not have answers and not have, do you need to be praying every day? What is that? If you want to, sure. But do you need to have a daily spiritual practice? Like giving people permission to let go of the idea that they need to do anything and sitting with people and constructing, you know, so again, with like, it's not so much what is real and what is true and finding that it's like, what is functional for you? And okay, let's not even talk about God. Fine. I don't, we don't need to at all, but let's talk about where you want to go now. So there's like an analogy in spiritual direction that, um, 
is used. I think Brittany Hartley uses this analogy of like, we're kind of like mice in a little maze in life. And um, we have, we're working towards the cheese and we're running away from the cat. And in Mormonism, the cheese is eternal life with our family and God. And the cat is Satan and temptation. So we're running away from Satan and temptation. We're running towards this cheese. And it's so motivating that it feels like, yay, we're going, we're moving. We have a purpose and purpose feels good and purpose is important. Um, like Victor Frankl's Meaning of Life book, well, you know, like it's really helpful to have a purpose uh, and to have some movement. And then so suddenly you take away the cheese and you take away the cat and you're just like, what? What it? No cheese, no cat. Where am I going? I'm just, <laughs> I'm just floundering this lone mouse in this maze. Where am I? What even is this maze? Where am I going? What am I doing? Ah! You know, and you can feel, ah, I have no purpose. And so part of my job I see is like walking along with the mice. That's okay. Now what do you like? And what motivates you? And what is something that sparks a little bit of hope, a little bit of joy, a little bit of connection, a little bit of purpose? Can that be the cheese? Is it connection with your fellow humans? Is it poetry? Is it bubble baths? Is it anything? Simple little joys of life. We can make that. And then what is the you want to maybe avoid? Fear? Shame? Guilt? Like what? So like plating a little so you have a little because purpose can feel helpful, feel good. It's not necessary. If you want to be a little mouse alone in the little maze, not moving, fine by me. <laughs> so my job, I feel like as a spiritual director, is never to say you have to be religious. You have to believe in God because barf, I don't. But I think it's helpful to have a companion. In a little maze, we feel a little lonely. It's helpful to kind of reconstruct what, notice what our inner voice is saying, notice what sparks joy and hope and life in us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I have a couple questions for you. My first question is just, um, what are s some of the most challenging parts of rebuilding for you? Like mm. what have been the harder parts to this? Mm -hmm. um, I will say... I hit on this a little bit earlier, but like the thought was very terrifying to me that I won't notice if I am being taken advantage of. Not only that, I will defend it to the death. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I really, really would have argued tooth and nail, like I am not being taken advantage of in Mormonism. I want to be here. I am making this of my own free will and choice, 100%. Mm. Um, so kind of coming, are you saying kind of coming face to face with that? Well, yeah. Well, and what's, stopping that from happening again and me not noticing. Got it. Like not being able to trust my own um, ability to notice if I'm in a dangerous situation that is harming me Yeah, was very, very scary. And yeah. like, how do I, and that's what I work with my spiritual director with. I have a spiritual director, shout out Roy Lee Nodison. Roy, you're the best. Um, helping me to kind of like reconstruct that in myself. She's very helpful. Um, but that's been challenging. The other big challenging, like I said, my patriarchy crisis hit so hard and was so deeply painful. And I mean, I was such a late bloomer, but when I bloomed, boy, howdy, did I bloom as a feminist. <laughs> like, yeah. It hit so hard and painful and like reorienting my life as not a patriarchal tragedy has been... I, I'm not pink bowing it. It's not an end. I'm in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's been hard. Yeah, yeah. no. And, and the grief, the grief of really feeling like my life choices weren't my own. My life choices were the churches. Yeah. Um, and what would my life have been like? And then, you know, so sitting with that at the same time, sitting with, there's a lot of value in like, my life's pretty good. And my four kids are pretty awesome. And I love them a lot. And I'm so thankful I have them. You know, there's this complicated feeling like, would I have had them had I've been acting in my free, full will and choice? I don't know, but they're here mm -hmm. and this is my life. And um, yeah, that's been challenging. Yeah. And then on the flip side, what are some of, you know, what you would say is like victory moments mm -hmm. or beautiful moments, celebratory moments as you've been rebuilding too? Mm, great question. I think the biggest benefit of... My, this whole journey has been not calling the voice of shame in my head, God, and knowing that I don't have to live with that voice. Yeah. Not knowing that I don't have to be constantly faced with my deficiencies as a necessary practice of self-improvement. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I don't have to improve at all if I don't want to. That's right. Yeah. And um, so just like that was such a monumental shift in um, loving myself and self-love, which made, I mean, 
enormous ripple effects in my capacity for happiness. My capacity for love was just so elevated by not believing that voice of shame in my head and knowing that's not a necessary thick part of my life. Um, that's been the best fruit of the whole thing, I think, is really having a nicer voice in my head. Mm, and that's um, big. Yeah, an ability to embrace imperfection and embrace uncertainty and have that be okay. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, moments of victory. I can remember before I left the church, taking my kids to the lake, sitting, thinking about all this faith crisis stuff, sitting hard, and I saw like a crow flying past. And I was like, that's almost me. I'm, I'm not there yet, but I'm about ready to break free and fly. And I don't know what that's going to look like, but I can feel that it's coming. It's like building in me and I'm not there yet. And now like every time I see like a crow, I'm like, it's me. I'm free. Mm. Like I don't have these restrictions of duty and obligation and I must have to and need to and should. Those are kind of evaporating more and more each year and I'm feeling more and more free and it's really beautiful. Yeah, that's beautiful. Okay, my last question is around, I'm trying to think how I would want you to answer it. Almost like your past self, if your past mm. self could see your current self in reality, like what's most surprising to you about where you are right now? From my past self's yeah. point of view? Uh-huh. Like what, what surprises you most from like the conditioning or what you've what you were kind of taught to think about who, you, how you might feel, who you might be, you know, at this stage and, and what you now no longer hold to mm. and what you do hold to. Is there something in particular that you're like, yeah, it's kind of surprising. Yeah. Uh, reframing selfishness, I'm going to say, yeah. because, um, I didn't bring this up, but a major goal of mine, the, the song Window to His Love by Julie DeZavito Hanks um, was so foundational for me. I heard it first in high school and I felt so many goosebumps and I was like, this is it. This is my life's purpose, which so part of the lyrics are like, with each passing day, I want to fade away till I become a window to his love. And I was like, that's what I want. I want to fade away. With each passing year, I want to disappear. Wow. Yeah. Till I become a window to his love. And I was like, all I want in life is to be a window to, I'll, I, I don't even want people to look at me and see Celeste. I want people to look at me and see the love of Christ. And um, thinking that, that more and more, like thinking this would be my life, that with each passing year, I would disappear until I would become yeah. the embodiment of Christ's love, like just a window. And um, so I think my like journey of like, no, I don't want to disappear. I don't want to fade away. I want to be, because I kind of, going back to my spiritual beliefs, like I believe that I am the universe. I am consciousness experiencing life as Celeste Davis with brown hair and blue eyes, born in Texas with my thoughts and my feelings and my hormones. And I'm here for such a short time as the universe experiencing this. And I want to be as full of Celeste Davis as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. And in bright technicolor, I want to have Celeste Davis's thoughts and opinions and feelings and actions and desires. And I want to be full of that self, self full, not selfless. And I don't want to fade away. And that is really beautiful to me that I am here just to experience the universe as Celeste is what I think I'm here to do, not to create some big purpose, not to point people to God, not to say anybody has to do anything except experience this brief little moment as your complete and full self. Yeah. Beautiful. So beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. All the yeses. <laughs> so one of the most profound things my wife, partner Margie, has ever uh, shared on this podcast is when I asked her in her, in her sort of deconstruction, reconstruction episode, I asked her about her beliefs now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, her response was, I think beliefs are overrated. Yeah, totally. um, <laughs> I agree with that. I love that. I agree with That's that. That's brilliant, Margie. Um, mm -hmm. having said that, I'm gonna ask you about your beliefs. Sure. So <laughs> because one of the most maddening, but totally understandable things I get 
it's it's Christians and evangelical Christians that come on YouTube or Instagram or Facebook, and they're like, I've already said this on I think on last episode. I'm so sad that more ex Mormons end up throwing away God and Jesus, and they throw away the Bible, and they throw away the baby with the bath of water, and and I don't mean to mock that, mm -hmm. and I understand it, um, but. Putting my issues aside, I'm just going to ask you to address those things. So, mm -hmm. so I guess we've already talked about God. Is there anything that you want to say about God, or do you feel like you've kind of said it? God is everything and nothing. God is your present moment. Mm -hmm. There's beauty everywhere. God is love. Anything else? Yeah, I mean, again, in tying in like other beliefs other than God into that question. Um, again, I'm never searching for empirical truth or ever to force anybody into anything just to find what's functional for them. And so for me, I have found a functional belief, I guess. I mean, not that this is like a core belief. This is all, we're all just experimenting, right? Like I could change my mind tomorrow. This isn't like a foundational thing, but there's a video on YouTube called the egg. And it's all about how, like, it's about this man dying. And when he dies, he is meeting his creator and, um, it comes out that he's going to go back and be like reincarnated. And, um, and he's going back as like a woman peasant in like the year 400 in Mongolia. And it comes out basically in this video that like all of it is just the same being dying and becoming somebody else in the past, in the future. All of it is one being, one soul gaining this collective consciousness, this collective experience, experiencing the world through this personality, through these hormones, through these brain imbalances and family and whatever culture um, and picking up you know, knowledge and wisdom and beauty along the way, but we are all one and we are all each other. And we are all like, like you are a, an iteration of me and you are an iteration of me and I am an iteration of you. And I find that very functional in terms of like, I find it very functional to believe we are all like have a unit of consciousness and united. And I don't hold those beliefs. Like this is definitely going to happen when we die. It's just like, this is a functional way for me to kind of envision what I'm doing here and I just kind of feel like my purpose is to create whatever the universe wants to create as embodied as the brown haired, blue eyed Celeste Davis creature I am. And um, I'm here to experience life as this creature and to create what whatever this creature wants to create. And, and that was your response about God. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay. So let's do Jesus now. Oh, okay. Is there still a Jesus? Do you consider yourself a Christian? Oh, man. And, that, and with that is the resurrection and heaven and the afterlife. Those are all traditional Christian, essential core Christian teachings. Mm. John, I have thought so much about Jesus. I can't even tell you. <laughs> Just hours and years and weeks and deconstructing and reconstructing and then deconstructing again and then reconstructing again and just... I think that Jesus is such a tender spot for Mormons because in contrast to the God who's the judge and Jesus is the advocate, it's like Jesus is the nice one. Like you can't lose Jesus, you know, like Jesus, like <laughs> at least believe in Jesus, please. Like he's the nice one. Like people, and even me as a Mormon, I couldn't imagine life without Jesus. He was my guy. He was my advocate. He was my supporter, my brother. Mm -hmm. Like life without Jesus as a Mormon, conceptualizing that would burst into tears. And I have had friends burst into tears right in front of me uh, talking about Jesus. Like the thought that I don't have Jesus anymore is deeply tragic to them. Um, yeah. So yeah, I deconstructed and reconstructed so much. And I used to, and I talked about, there's so many actually legitimately beautiful constructions of Jesus out there in the progressive Christian world. Richard Rohr being chief among them, the universal Christ, beautiful. And, um, Rachel Held Evans. You see Rachel Held that? Evans. Yeah. Yes. Even Eckhart Tolle talks a lot about Christ mm -hmm. consciousness. Rob Bell. Rob Bell. Thank you. So many that are just, I loved, oh my gosh, I could not get enough. They were so soul satisfying to me because I could never imagine life without Jesus. But then actually I wrote a poem about why I don't talk about Jesus anymore. Can I read that? Yeah, sure. Okay. Please. Yeah. Yeah. You can pull it up. And, and, uh. Yeah, we, we love it. And and I should mention that you have what's called a Substack. And I'm new to this, but apparently Substack is kind of like this blogging writers platform mm -hmm. where people can subscribe to it and maybe even pay to support the authors. And then authors can share cool wisdom and also get compensated for it. Yeah, I don't have the paid structure set up yet, but I'm planning to in the future. So um, right now it's called 
deep thoughts with Celeste, but it's substack.celestemdavis.com. But I'm going to switch it to non-spiritual non-direction for reasons we've already articulated. <laughs> non-spiritual non-direction. Yeah. Right. Basically, like the subtitle would be scratching the existential itch with a spiritual director who is deeply skept- skeptical of both spirituality and directions. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah okay. Great. So on my Instagram account where I talk about faith, I talked about Jesus all the time and this really beautiful reconstruction versions of um, you know, Jesus as a radical advocate for the marginalized and Jesus as just mm-hmm. lots of different, really beautiful ways to think of Jesus. And then I kind of just stopped talking about Jesus altogether on that account. And I have people asking, why are you still Christian? What do you think about Jesus? You used to love Jesus. I used to point to Jesus as like the reason I left, right? Like I'm following Jesus out. Mm, left Mormonism. Yeah. Like I'm not, I'm not leaving Mormonism because I stopped believing in Christ. I was leaving because I, I did and I was listening and he says, go care for the poor and needy. And we're not, you know? Anyway, so, okay, here's this poem. It's called Why I Don't Talk About Jesus Much Anymore. Because a name that can bring liberation just as often brings captivity. Because a name that elicits song just as often is used to silence. Because that name means something different to every single person who hears it. And I never know. Are you one whose scars are erased by that name? Or who carries scars of self-loathing from it? Are you one who uses that name to set others free or to cuff them in shame when not compliant? Are you one who feels a warm blanket of love envelop you at the sound of that name? Or does the name bring back nightmares of accounting for drops of blood spilt by the hands of your inadequacy? Because my own fingers are still pruny from trying to wash those blood drops off my hands. Because when they call, they are called out for saying hurtful things, the influencer, the BYU professor, the apostle, Predictably, their next month's posts are all about Jesus, because Jesus is always a safe topic, free from criticism, because somehow the man who ruffled all the feathers is now used to not ruffle any, and I'm so tired of shiny feathers. Because somehow at some point, the man who radically preached nonviolence and included everyone as his neighbor has become the poster child for gun rights and turning out immigrants. Because the man who freed the woman from needing to return to the well every week by showing her the living water coursing through her own body has somehow been confined into a miniature plastic well bodyguarded by men, which we must return to drink every week in order to adequately apologize for existing. Because his words are full of beauty and love and wisdom, but so are the words of Lao Tzu, Maya Angelou, Siddhartha, and Rumi. And I've spent so many hours of so many years dedicating myself single-eyed to the love and wisdom of this one teacher that I can't help now frolicking off to smell the flowers, hike the forests, and feast on the vast heavenly offerings from other kingdoms that I've missed out on while exploring only one. Because to believe I need a savior is to believe I I am inherently damned, and I do not believe that. Because my heart is heavy thinking of the millennia of women and men who were taught with father, son, and spirit that deity is exclusively male, and I mourn the millions of ways the world would be different if Mother God was allowed the throne. The worldwide mother wound is so catastrophic that I refuse to use even one more sentence spreading the exclusively male Godhead. Because his signature was forged on policies, press releases, excommunications, stock investments, and affidavits of an institution that displays his name like a hunting trophy. And I sometimes lack the energy to try and separate the real name from its innumerable forgeries. Because learning of the all, for the radical, all loving, all inclusive Jesus ushered in an era holding the courage I needed to set myself free and I'll always be grateful. The delicious taste of liberation Jesus still lingers pleasantly on my tongue. But I now find myself in an era where past feelings of a church and a father who used that name as a bargaining chip in a business transaction where the currency was my guilt and fear position themselves on the rug of my mind and refuse to be swept under it. Because I know many will glance at what I call beauty and see only ashes. To them, all is ashes without him. But please know, the one who pioneered death and rebirth surely understands the cycle of beauty turning to ash, turning to beauty. Was it not he who showed that each time new beauty is birthed, old beauty must die? I do not talk about Jesus much anymore, perhaps, because the more beauty arises from the bonfire of my former beliefs, the harder it becomes to muster the energy to separate out the parts of his name worth keeping from the parts begging to be turned into ash." Mic drop. Mm, mm, mm. Amen. Can I get an amen, Margie? It's just exquisite. Oh, I, so I just Googled that. I can't find it. Oh, it's on my Instagram. Mm. Sorry, wow. that, that's not on my sub stack. Yeah. Wow. 
Julia in her notes just wrote like four exclamation points. Oh, to that. so much there. That was super so good. So much there, Thank yeah. you. Yeah, that was amazing. Get that out there. How, <laughs> how can we help you get that out there? We will help you get that out there. Okay, it's just a post on Instagram. This is before I started oh, my sub so It's Just a post on Instagram. It's not Googleable, unfortunately. No, that was amazing. That was Carolyn Pearson, my Angela level wisdom. So. Oh my gosh, how nice. Thank you. Well, you need gold stars. That's your. I you're, love gold you're, stars. You're Yay! Thank Level you. three. What is it? <laughs> yeah, gold, gold stars are my love language. They're like you. I go internal. I'm about going into, except for the gold stars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got keep them. those. Keep those in steady. Keep that in a hot, steady flow my way. That would be great. That's right. Thank you. Yeah, that was good. Okay. Yeah. All right. Beautiful. Thank you. That was powerful. Okay. I guess then. I think we've already talked about like life purpose. I don't think we need to go into Joseph Smith or the Book of Mormon. Um, maybe the last thing is people just really want some resolution about death mm-hmm. and heaven in the afterlife. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you, what do you say to people now about death in the afterlife mm, and yeah. eternal life? Oh, yeah. I am working with someone now whose um, father has passed and she left Mormonism three years ago, maybe, and um, really struggling, really struggling. Um, it's deeply, deeply, deeply sad to her to no longer believe that she will see her dad. Um, and to that I say, you could believe whatever you want. Like find something that's functional and live as if, right? That's um, such a beautiful teaching from so many wisdom teachers to live as if, to like create whatever. And I assigned her an assignment to like write out the most beautiful possible um, at version of afterlife that she can possibly imagine the most lovely, the most, the one she's kind of would really love to see happen and write it out and then live as if that can happen. Why not? If you want to be able to see your father in the next life, why on earth would I say you can't believe that? Like if you want to still talk to your dead parents, of course, like talk to them. If you want to talk to a God who's really helps fill you with love and support and worth and safety and wholeness, Talk to them, believe in that, of course. Like whatever is functional for you that causes no harm, like do it, believe in it. Why not? Okay, Um, and I love that. And then what if there's a follow-up question, which is, well, how did you get comfortable not needing necessarily a belief in the resurrection or an afterlife? Or did you just describe how you think about the afterlife? That is... I mean, yeah, like I just kind of try things on, experiment. What's it like to live this month not believing in a God at all? Let's try that out. What's it like living this month not believing in an afterlife? What's that like? Okay, that's fine too. Well, what's it like this month writing out my most ideal, perfect, most lovely version of the afterlife I can possibly conjure and living this month as if I believe in that? Well, that's nice. I like that <laughs> being like universally connected and filled with hope and love. Like, why not? The, like, what are its fruits? Are the fruits good? Okay. Um, yeah, that, that said, I mean, that's not, maybe that's a skill that I have that I'm not even recognizing, but I find that easy to live and pretend if it's very functional for me and I see no harm in it. I don't think everybody functions that way. And I think some people do need more concrete truth claims to be like, no, but what will happen? Um, which, you know, I empathize with and I'll listen to, but my personal philosophy is constructing beauty and creating whatever I can envision to be the most beautiful and living as if that were going to happen. Beautiful. Beautiful. Wow. Okay. So I guess I want to end by like, I mean, I, I said to you on the break, like, where's your YouTube channel? Where's your book? Like, where are your workshops and retreats? Why aren't you holding retreats and workshops? And you're like, hey, how about I'm learning to just be happy and like, <laughs> not having to, like, need the gold stars and the reinforcement, right? right. So anyway, yeah. you do, as of now, have an Instagram and a Substack, uh, and you're, you've got a TikTok. I have a little baby TikTok. Um, a few posts there. And you have a coaching practice. Yeah. I thought, I'm sorry, I shouldn't be coaching. Uh, tell people about that. And if they want or need to reach out to you, what, what types of things you might work with them on? Sure. Um, yeah. So if you're interested in hiring me, awesome. I'd love to work with you. I work with lots of people still in the church, people 
sitting in the middle, people who have left, um, just companioning um, and finding new 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 ways to interact with spirituality, um, new senses, or even if you don't want to say spirituality or God at all, that's totally fine by me. We can just talk about connection. We can just talk about purpose. Um, or you can just talk about whatever's going on in your life and I'll use my tool belt of reconnecting to some image that you find centering and grounding. Um, and yeah, you can do that on my website. You can, I am taking the month of July off. So I'll be back in August, um, meeting with people for spiritual direction sessions, which you can schedule right on my website, celestemdavis.com. Um, you can sign up for those now, even though it's in August and, um, what else? Everything is at Celeste M. Davis, Substack, Instagram, TikTok, and my website. And Celeste as in E at the end. <laughs> C-E-L-E-S-T-E. E. -E. e. M. Davis. M. Davis, yes. Beautiful. Okay. Margie, any final questions or thoughts or gold stars? Hmm. Stars upon thars? <laughs> <laughs> and Star the... belly sneeches? <laughs> no, just that it was a gift to, to be present. Thank you so today. Much. So thank you. Thank you. All right. And what what is the anything you want to say about what the future holds for you in terms of what you hope to give to the world beyond what you've already given? I will just say it is such a gift to me to walk along to spiritually companion people on this journey wherever they are at on this journey like literally I feel I end each session and I feel so lucky. Like I legitimately love doing it. I love that I discovered it. I love that I found something that aligns so well with my passions and my talents and my interests. And whether you're in the church, out of the church, I have so much empathy for every stage. And just, I mean, for the people who've already met with me, thank you. Like what a blessing. I love each of them so deeply. Um, yeah, I would love to just keep doing that. I like legitimately love walking people alongside people on this journey. And honestly, what an honor to witness people's biggest self-empowerment moments. It's a privilege. Beautiful. So like a YouTube channel, you're not going to commit uh, to that. Uh, <laughs> to be determined, I guess. TikTok, heavy but TikTok. Back, but back to the YouTube channel. <laughs> that's, that's all nice and great, but, but back to... The and and retreats and, you know. <laughs> retreats is going to be a no for me. I experimented with that. I found it very it changed, They changed your life. I found, I did. The Mormon Matters Retreat did. But me, plan, I planned one and I found it so overwhelming that I was like, pass. Receiving, receiving the gifts of a retreat. Very yes, different. Very than different. Orchestrating. Than planning the food. <laughs> yeah. Very different. <laughs> very different. Very different. All right. <laughs> well, Celeste, thank you for making your way here. Thanks for sharing your story on Mormon Stories. Thanks for all the ways you've helped people. And I'm thrilled to add you to my list of people I'm going to be referring mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. because I know there's just a massive hunger and a need out there for coaches and for wisdom and for spiritual support and for post-religion and post-church construction. And Margie does some of that work, but, you know, she's full – Natasha's full, Jan is full, everybody's got yeah. a gazillion month wait list. So I, I hope you don't mind. I'm adding you to my referral list. Thank you. I'm honored. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so thanks again. Thank Take you. care. Come thanks. back. Will you come back? Sure. All right. <laughs> and Margie, it is always amazing to have you with me and with us. So thank you for all your wisdom. Yes. Oh, thank you, Margie. Thank you. I so really enjoyed it. it. Yeah. All right. And of course, you do coaching too, right? We never really call you out. We should, but you can go to beautyinthenow.org and Margie also does coaching. That's right. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining us today on Mormon Stories. I actually, uh, I'll end with this. I got, a, um, I got a comment on a post on Facebook in the Mormon po Stories podcast community where Laurie Bell writes, you do a really good job of balancing truth facts with, LD, with things like LDS discussions and having content for various ages, I love the stories. It would be helpful to have now what episodes or discussions. People don't know where to go, what to do. Um, to realize I was just a loyal soldier was so disappointing. Anyway, that's what we try to do with Gift of the Mormon Faith Crisis podcast. Almost nobody knows about that or checks it out. So I do, and, and, and with the Thrive stories that we did with Margie, we've also tried to do that, 
but I am really interested in more Mormon Stories content that helps people through the what now. So maybe Margie, you and Celeste can join together to, to create some of that content. Your it's brain is just like, let me solve all the problems I see. I love you. I Let's see go. you. Well, if any of you really value or like this type of content, please email us at mormonstories at gmail.com. Comment on these episodes. Let us know you value it. Become a monthly donor. Go to mormonstories.org. Click on the donate button. Become a monthly donor if you value this stuff, and we'll keep providing it. And if you have ideas of other types of content uh, that you need, um, inspired by today's episode, let us know, and we'll we'll figure out how to provide it for you, with or without Celeste or Margie or anyone else. So anyway, thanks for supporting us. Be kind to each other. Be good to each other. And we'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Uh, take care, everybody.